So anyway, I need bail money. Uh, welcome back to Hoops HD, yeah. and as always, David Griggs needs bail money. Um, <laughs> this is Hoops HD. This is our September podcast. I'll come to you actually during the month of September. We are, uh, you know, we don't normally do it that well, but uh, I'm your host, Chad Sherwood, up here in the middle. Ooh. Joining me, as always, David Griggs on one side, Joby Fortz on the other, John Stalika, and from Bracketeer.org, we have Rocco Miller. Uh, and we have, a, we have an interesting uh, topic that is very in the news, very relevant right now that we want to discuss tonight. And that is the recent law that was passed and is currently on the governor's desk, I believe, out in California for potential signing or veto to allow student athletes, to require that student athletes be allowed to be compensated for their name, image, and likeness. Basically get endorsement deals. Allow student athletes to go out and uh, make a deal with Nike and get their name and, and get paid for it um, or whatever mm -hmm. company they want to do. And it's also a potential law in South Carolina that's, that's being batted around and has not gone to their house yet. Uh, and just, I believe yesterday, uh, Mark Emmert made a statement claiming that this was an existential threat to the collegiate model of athletics uh, and the biggest threat that the NCAA has faced during his tenure despite the fact that we have things like FBI trials going on. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, so that shows you how important that, that this topic is right now. And, and I mean, the other thing, the other big news that came out this week was, was that has to do with the uh, University of Kansas getting a three no, level one uh, violations levied against them, all having to do with money going to college athletes and, kind of the idea here being well maybe if we get a way to pay college athletes then we wouldn't need to be doing it under the table and we wouldn't need to be having schools like Kansas facing significant penalties uh from the notice of allegations so on that note I think I just threw a lot of information out there but uh, it, it, we want to kind of practice discuss started this. yesterday practice we are practicing we uh, for, yeah, for, at 40 days from the start of the college basketball season but I want to kind of kind of get each of your takes uh, on this on, on the California law and how it and is this a threat to the NCAA model, or is this a good thing? Um, and Joe, you just popped up on my screen, so let me start with you yeah, on this whole topic. Happy to. I have uh, very strong feelings on this, uh, and it, they might seem incongruous at some points. But fact is, I truly believe strongly that an athlete should be able to profit off their name and likeness. Uh, it is their just because you sign a letter of intent doesn't mean you should be waving IP rights away and trademark, et cetera, away. I, I, I find that a very uneven negotiation. That being said, and so all of a sudden the athlete groups are very happy with what I just said, but now you're not going to be so happy. I do think the NCAA has a right to regulate it because they are the ones who control the games, who set the stage. Um, if there is a rule, for instance, that it goes into an annuity, uh, so that it's not just over that, you know, someone pays a kid X amount of dollars for signing a few autographs or, you know, et cetera. And the money is there then and that now, um, if the NCAA wants to put in rules on that, they are perfectly allowed to do so. And I'm not necessarily against that. I am against flat out besides the cost of living. Uh, stipends that we're talking about uh, for going to school. Uh, I, I don't think students have to, that athletes should be paid. The fact of the matter is directly paid. Um, the fact of the matter, because then you want, there's a zillion pieces with it. Title nine. So are you going to pay a football player more because they bring more revenue in than the female volleyball player? You got title nine issues right there, right there. You do. And, Title IX volleyball, all of a sudden teams are going to be cutting Title IX sports, you know, and the men's sports to reduce it, you know, to pay for it. It's, it's a very slippery slope, especially in the non-Power Five uh, areas where the revenue is not as great from television, from football and men's basketball, and to a lesser extent, women's basketball. So I think that there are limitations to this. Plus, the last thing I'll say on this topic is, Everybody says, oh, you know, a scholarship, that's all it is. Talk to Lori Laughlin about how important a scholarship is. I'm serious. You know, we, you know, we make fun of these people. But people 
hey, half a million, the, the value of a USC scholarship in the marketplace is a half a million dollars. Okay? That's what it is. That's what Lori Laughlin paid. Half a million dollar value is pretty good to go play basketball or play football or to yacht or whatever the hell, you know, you know Lori Laughlin's kids were supposed to be doing. That, that, that is a pretty good value because as the NCAA correctly, and I rarely say NCAA and correct in the same sentence, but the NCAA correctly says 99% of them aren't going pro in this. And so you get a dang good education for free. That's a good deal for 99% of the kids out there. And I don't want to make rules for the future LeBron James who might want to skip it. Fine, skip, skip college. That's a different topic altogether. Well, Joby, let me just, just clarify. You're not saying that there's a Title IX issue with being able to sell your name, image, and likeness. You're talking no, about if the school it actually – actually pays this that's where there's the I, i'm not sure that's it well the schools are going to say that's not a title nine issue because if it turns out that student athletes are employees title nine deals with equal opportunity to educational oppor- you don't want to get to that but schools will never go to the point where they are employees and the reason why is because of the unionization issue you don't want to go that down that road they um, will if the courts tell them they have to this supreme court will never ever ever say that so wait wait until justice thomas retires 20 years from now and then we'll talk (laughs) you know i mean uh, uh, rocco let let, let, let me bring you in here on this on the same thing do do you agree with joby that yes name image and likeness we should allow these athletes to be compensated for it if they can because again part of this is you've actually got to go out and get that endorsement deal you've got to have somebody come to you and say hey i will pay you to put your face on the, uh, on the latest EA sports title or whatever it is. Yeah. I, I mean, I actually, well, first of all, it's a privilege to even be uh, in the same discussion as Joby on such a topic. This is a very loaded topic as we all know. Um, so I appreciate you guys having me on tonight, but um, I would, I would say I'm, I mostly agree almost probably almost completely agree with what Joby said in regards to um, you know, the, the special talent out there uh, being able to go out there and make a profit I also think there could be, um, and then also the other part that Joby said about, you know, the NCAA, you know, still controlling the show and making this, uh, you know, whether it goes into an annuity where where the money goes, you know, I think for basketball, it's a very different discussion than it is for football. Like if we're talking about Johnny Menzel, who has to stay at Texas A&M for three years versus Zion Williamson, who's only at Duke for six months, it's a whole different discussion. It's a lot more money involved. But um, I do think also a, another idea for the NCAA as they look to solve this gigantic problem would be um, to make this a positive wherever they can. I think one way they could do that is by requiring anybody that does earn any um, additional income from their NIL uh, to be required to take a money management course or some type of financial um, uh, advisory type of course while they're in college. Because I think the biggest thing that happens to athletes that wouldn't be to a value is historically so many athletes end up broke and without an education. So they can kind of flip the script on that and say, hey, listen, you guys can make money off your name, image, and likeness. By the way, that profit comes from other organizations like a Nike, like a Wheaties box, like your local you know, plumbing store if you're the star at uh, William & Mary, right? So um, – yeah, you can do that, but we want to make it educational. We want you to also understand how to manage this money as you go along. Uh, I think that would be a good element to add to it for, for them as they look to solve a gigantic problem. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll tell you that that I have in front of me, I'll just take a look at it right now. It's the NCAA uh, Board of Governors put together a letter in response to the California law uh, a couple I, weeks ago. I, I'm glad you're looking at it. Are you talking about the one that they issued today? Uh, it was actually written dated September 11, but uh, I have oh, Okay. Let, let, let me just, I just want to read a couple of quotes for it, David, and get your response for, okay. for it. But uh, it starts off by, by knowing that the 1,100 schools that make up the NCAA have always, in everything we do, supported a level playing field for all stu- student athletes. goes on a little bit later to say that California Senate Bill 206, which is the law we're discussing, would upend that balance. If the bill becomes law and California's 58 NCAA schools are compelled to allow an unrestricted name, image, and likeness scheme, it would erase the critical distinction between college and professional athletics 
And because it gives those schools an unfair recruiting advantage would result in them eventually becoming unable to compete in NCAA competitions. Uh, it goes on from there, David, but that's a real strong language saying, almost threatening, isn't it? That, that, that we may not let you, let you in the NCAA anymore. It, it is threatening. Um, at least the language of it is. Now, how much teeth does it really have? The, the, the problem with that letter, and there's some other things in there too, I, let, let me back up a little bit. Regardless of whether or not you think college athletes should be paid, whether or not it meets some ideal or ethic uh, of, of amateurism, that is an interesting discussion. But I think we're almost past that now. And we're on to what does the NCAA have to do to keep any sort of control over this? Uh, you can't, I, I mean, do they not understand what a law is? There, the argument here is that, like, is that essentially the NCAA, or, or one of the stronger arguments, is that they are in violation of antitrust laws. Um, we had heard that about a year ago or so when we had Andy Schwartz, I believe it was, on the show, and he explained that, in his opinion, um, it constituted price fixing or wage fixing. And for them to go after this law like that and then to use language that isn't even factually correct, all 1,100 schools do not complete. On an, on an even plane. There's three divisions. There's three different rule books. They don't even compete under the same rules. And the idea that the playing field is level is almost laughable. And when you're, di and when you're trying to figure out what does the NCAA need to do in order to maintain control, and they fail to make any sort of a legal, actual argument, in my opinion, that would win if this lands in court. It's, it's kind of discouraging. And it makes me think, that if they don't make concessions that I know that they don't want to make, then they may end up losing control of everything and simply doing event management. Well, David, as I stated, I agree with the use of name and likeness, you know, et cetera, the right. having right to do it. However, that is my fairness view. That's not my legal view. My well, legal view is that the NCAA can tell California to go pound sand. Because they have a right, they have a right to require their members to do particular requirements to join the NCA. The antitrust angle is very interesting, but until we get to that point, which is way down the road legally, I, I think we the get there is they could cut off California institutions. They they most certainly could tell you Pac-12 if UCLA is your is your representative or et cetera from. The Pac-12, well, Pac-12, you're going to have to find a new rep. You better send Utah instead or whatever. They, I don't know that they – well – Just I, like they can say someone, because they were deemed cheating, is no longer eligible. Like Missouri is not eligible to participate, you know, and have an extra game for a bowl or participate in the BCS. They can set their own rules for what – who gets to participate. Yeah. I don't think well, it's fair. Okay. I, I agree with you on the fairness – but legally, they do have a right. Until the the response to that is going to be, well, the rules that we are being disqualified for are against the law anyway, and we are taking you to court, which has not been a friendly place for the NCAA the last few years. Just over the summer, I, I think it was July or, or August, a, a, a settlement that they did not dispute. They had to pay, was it over $200 million or $208 million to former football and basketball players for using their name, image, and likeness. That does not bode well as, um, you know, to have that on the books. If they try and ban a school from championship play on the grounds that they were allowed to – allowed players their name, image, and likeness, isn't that a hell of a reference for those schools if they take the NCAA they, to court? The fact the that they fact lost is already – has total control for who gets to participate in their competitions while they remember nonprofits in this case, but nonprofit corporations have the representation of people and they have right of assembly. And that's what it kind of comes down to with the argument. They have a right to say you get, as long as they're not discriminatory in other uh, protected class ways, which that is not the case here. Uh, in other words, you know, race, etc. cetera. Um, they have a right to say, Hey, the people who want to who, who want to participate with us have to follow our rules. And you can definitely argue antitrust. I think there's some 
you know, strong arguments that come with like antitrust, et cetera. But that is, that's a long developed case. If the NCAA cut it off tomorrow, tomorrow, at least in the short run, they would be winning. Uh, they couldn't get, I doubt California could get injunctive relief. Well, but, you know, maybe California just says, hey, well, forget you. We'll, we'll do our own exactly. championship. We'll, exactly. we'll name our own exactly. champion. But, and now here comes exactly. South Carolina, passes the same law. Exactly. Ten other states follow. And Joby, now, now so, so the NCAA has got nothing left to do because, because yeah. they're, they're left with Hawaii, North Dakota, and, and Rhode Island. And, that, that's, and that's a different that's, kettle of fish. Yeah, and, yeah, Chad, let me, ju- let me jump yeah, let me jump in here about yeah. South Carolina. It's it's all, and again, it's not nearly. It hasn't progressed nearly to the degree that the California one has. But it is offering more. It is offering name, image, likeness, and up to five thousand dollars. So it's essentially North Car- or California, excuse me, plus five thousand dollars. Right, right. right. The, the, the proposal also would allow the schools to pay a five thousand dollar a year stipend in addition to the name, image, likeness. Also include the name and like this is for both laws is sponsorships, um, autograph sales, that type of thing. Okay, uh, so do you see what's sort of happening here? Say Texas comes along and says, well, we'll pay 10000 In North Carolina, they like their basketball. Well, we don't want to fall behind, so we'll pay 10000 in incentives. And I think, like, you're just going to see <laughs> – states continue to jump on board with this and trying to one up. Now the one that New York introduced was absolutely ridiculous. I think it was some it, like as student athletes would be guaranteed a percentage of the revenue that they generate. I, I don't even think that's legal, but there is, I, I mean, one of the things that I think the NCAA needs to be braced for is how do they answer this question? If schools were allowed to pay student athletes, would they do it? And the answer is yes. And then again, well, doesn't that constitute wage fixing if organizations like the uh, NLRB and others, and I think there's going to be more pushes through the courts to try and get athletes ruled legally uh, employees on the grounds that they, and again, there's, there's other people that know more about this well, than this I do. This is that, an area where I have at least some expertise. Okay. NLRB well, the, the, I, I'd be the NLRB in, case, David, uh, in that particular case, A, and I know there's not. Let, let me finish because like, guys. there's something else I want even, your opinion on. Even, yeah. even the Clinton-appointed judges said that was a ridiculous decision by the NLRB. Okay, so well, that, this is that's the, a long shot. Uh, okay, the long shot is they perform work, they 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 do so under control, and that the person that controls them benefits from the, from the work they do. Right. The, it, it, that is going to be the legal argument for it. And can the NC? I mean, I'm sure there's an argument against that that can win, but tr- call me crazy. I just don't have a lot of faith in the NCAA these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 let me kind of s- s- circle back to, to, to another uh, issue that, that, that was just mentioned here. It's sleek. Let me bring, bring you in on this. Uh, because when you look at college athletics, especially basketball and football, uh, the conferences are making a ton of money. The TV networks are making a ton of money. The universities are making a ton of money. Everybody's making a ton of money. The coaches are making tons of money. Who's not making money? The people that are actually producing the product they're getting nothing. Uh, isn't there a fundamental unfairness to the entire system? Well, this whole thing started, let's say, 2006 or 2007 when the Big Ten Network set up because that was a major game changer as far as bringing in more money for conferences like the Big Ten. The Pac-12 mm-hmm. followed suit, and then the SEC, and starting this fall, the ACC has launched their own network. And Woo! the University of Texas. For those that can watch it, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the whole the whole point is it's bringing in a lot more money than, let's say, 1988, 1978, back when there was much more limited coverage. We've also gotten to a point where we don't even pu- take teams off of TV anymore because it's going to unfairly punish other conference members as well, as another example. So, so, so Rocco, is, is this is the entire system just just flawed? Is there something? Do we just need to rewrite the book? I think, in a sense, yeah. And I, I mean, especially in basketball, I know we're focused on basketball here on on the on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's a there's a larger issue that's developed, and I think it all kind of stems from that. Um, I, I think just you know recently with the infrastructure being as it is, and with the one and done being such a big thing with the top recruits. 
uh, over the past, you know, ever since that rule changed around, around the same time, it's created a, a bubble. And within the bubble, you've got guys now, top prospects like a RJ Hampton, who from the time he was in fourth grade, his dad started helping him set up his own brand through his own team. And even though everybody from Kansas who thought they were getting him to Kentucky and everybody else um, were, were there and giving him everything he could want to, from a college basketball standpoint, it made all the sense in the world for him to uh, go play in Australia and get a, a shoe deal from China. Um, there, there's just this, this massive um, amount of money in the sport that trickles down from the NBA. There's also, you know, the, the commitment that, Turner and CBS made to the NCAA basketball tournament uh, that we talk about during tournament time where conferences are earning shares and the amount of money involved in that is massive. And so now the amount of uh, at-large bids each conference get has a lot more on the line than it ever has. And that number just goes up astronomically year over year. And so what we're seeing is um, a bubble created for more avenues for more uh, for up and coming prospects. We already see now two of the top 50 for next year's recruiting cycle, um, preferring to actually just develop on their own with trainers instead of play college basketball. And they're predicting that over five of the top 50 will not play college and potentially up to 10. And that's just in next year's recruiting cycle. So the NCAA has to make a decision. All the facts are in, in, their, um, in their face right now to, to work with. They understand, uh, to Joby's point, he knows a lot more on the, the legal side than I would will understand in, in, in uh, layman's terms. But I think if they want to push this, push this down the road, I don't think the California bill can actually go into effect after all the appeals and everything else till 2023. That gives them even three years till that's a real potential issue. If that, if that becomes a foregone conclusion, they still have time to prepare for it. Um, I think it's ultimately in the NCAA's best interest to keep the infrastructure the way it is from a conference standpoint and from a membership standpoint. So, I think as time goes on, they're going to start to get a tiny bit more flexible and incorporate. They're going to have to incorporate some real strategy if it's important to them and to their broadcast partners like Turner, CBS, being the forefront of, of the tournament. Do we care enough to keep this top talent playing in March Madness, or are we okay with potentially 20% or more of that talent pool leaving and playing either overseas or in a league like an HBL? Um, and I think that that's in front of them right now. You can see all the trends and you can, you can read about what the recruits are doing today. Uh, yeah, Joby, uh, as, as an attorney, you, you've made some good points here. Um, the NCAA, uh, if they called you up and asked for your help, would you give it to them? Because I think that they might need it. Because yeah, I don't well, think they well, have anybody. Very here's my biggest advice decisions. to the NCAA. The, the comparison is the uh, legalization of marijuana. Um, yeah, it's, it was very taboo just a generation Which ago. I highly now. recommend that for the NCAA. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> but now 31, 31 is states and jurisdictions in the District of Columbia have some form of legalization. But in many cases, what's happened is the infrastructure was poorly thought out, was legalization or not, and because there was such resistance to it from the opposition to it, actually creating a structure has failed miserably. And you have marijuana on the level of LSD that could really hurt people. Uh, what you need is knock it till you form, try. It's pretty good. What, which, it, which is, I use that as an example to, you need to prep for the regulation. The NCAA needs to understand, at least on name, image, and likeness, that they are in a losing spot. And if they realize that they are in the long term, even if it's not a losing spot tomorrow, it's a losing spot in a few years. They need to get a hold of it. Yes. At now they need to have, yeah, you know, some policies. I throw out annuity. I'm not saying that's what I'd support, but those sorts of ideas need to be discussed now. It can't be where a situation goes, okay, name and likeness. And then, you know, the university of Alabama boosters are are writing five hundred thousand dollars to every kid who wants a freaking autograph. That yeah you know, yeah that's not there's there has to be some reasonableness or it essentially is paying players. If you want to not pay players, you better work within the construct you know construct of image and likeness and get it right. right. I I'm like you. I don't 
I don't think they will. I think they're looking ahead, and we're going to have situations where people are going to get hurt uh, in, in some way, whether it's a failure, as Rocco pointed out, to manage money, or we've we've completely left the barn door open, and it's we might as well throw the whole idea of a scholarship being what is the worth of going to college athletics. You might as well throw that out the door. And, yeah. and, and that's great because I think what you're really hitting on there, Joby, is that the, there is a solution to all of this, which is the NCAA has got to get on this right now, craft their own rules, and get on, and, and start talking with California lawmakers and make it certain that, that, that this law gets amended to be in, in, in sync with a rule that, that, that can apply to all 50 states. Because that's the way we solve this, isn't it? Yes, I agree. And the other thing is – the ultimate question is, well, who represents the players? Like who represents the student athletes? And I don't want to say that this is universally true, but a lot of lawyers, and we all know how much we hate lawyers, particularly Chad and Joby, but um, like, uh, you know, they, one of the reasons they're pushing this is for their own selfish reasons. And, it, you know, why the, the, the settlement that just went out over the summer I, I don't know why that that was not more of a red flag. And I don't know why that the NCAA wasn't at least exploring the possibility that they are, that they can't keep control of this if they don't do exactly what you just said and try and craft their own rules, even if it means making concessions they don't want to make and doing yep. so in a way that the players and the people that represent them actually say, yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's good. We're happy now. And then we can kind of get back to business. Is there any other solutions than doing that? I mean, Rocco, is there anything? Else? I mean, I, 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 I like where the conversation's headed here because I, I completely agree with uh, they've got to have something in place, at least behind closed doors. I think the strategy, uh, from what I can tell, is if they can kick the can down the road, so, so to speak, like they already have with all the FBI responses and all of that, do that with this until it becomes an, a major emergency, but they have their plan now on how they're going to respond. I think that's the way that they're going to look at it from a maximizing revenue standpoint. If they can, if they go ahead and just go to a model now that allows people to profit and it cuts into their own profits at all, uh, I think they're going to kick the can down the road as far as they can um, because they want to maximize their revenues. Because the, the, I mean, look how much money Mark Emmert's making himself this year. So yeah. every 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 little bit they give up, it, it hits their own pocket. So it's a really tough thing for them to do. So I think. I think what they're doing is they're getting their ducks in a row, or at least they should be. And at the at the absolute last second, when they have to make a move, they're going to know what the plan is. Um, at least that's what they should be doing. But I think the only reason why they haven't even released any kind of inch yet is because they want to maximize profit for as long as they possibly can, whether that's at the end of this year or, or in three years. You're giving a lot of faith to the NCAA to, to actually like have a game plan. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, well, you well, mentioned kicking I, the can I, down the road. It could be Emmer just wants to kick the can down the road till he retires, then it's someone else's problem. If that could be the case. That, that, I think that's what you know, I'm concerned about, because that could definitely be the case. Yeah. Well, Salika, let me, let me bring you back in here again. Uh, do you agree with this solution? Is there other solutions that out there? Uh, I mean, wh where do you see this all going? I could possibly see in five or 10 years, someone possibly replacing the NCAA because we may be seeing some differences among states like California, New York, and South Carolina. Suppose there are states like, I don't know, hypothetically Indiana, where they don't allow for student athletes to profit off name, image, and likeness, pretty soon we'd probably need Congress to get some laws on a more federal level to at least get some unification among the colleges and universities. Yeah, and that's a huge problem. I think problem. what you'll see quicker, I think what you'll see quicker is that football will come into play and you'll see the break off of the Power Five and there is no NCAA. If it gets to the point where the NCAA is unmanageable, football will and the power of five schools will well, make the thing about that joby is that they already have autonomy and it's my understanding that if the power five wanted to allow players name image and likeness they could do it and not have to they could do that without breaking off right i i, th I think but getting back to sleeka's point here the idea of each state having its own books and and, and its own rule rule book and everything uh it's not going to be very conducive because 
why would a top college athlete want to go play in Indiana when he could get money to play in California? Uh, it's right. not going to happen. And, and that kind of gets back to Mark Emmert's point in the, in, in the letter that he wrote is, is that you're going to have, if you just let California law go as is without changing the rules across the board, every legitimate soon athlete that, that has a chance to sell his name, image, and likeness is going to go play for UCLA, USC, I don't know, UC or, Irvine, Cal I'm, Poly, I'm somewhere, yeah. right? Or the now other let me state. emphasize, this is not – I'm just throwing out a hypothetical as far as the state of Indiana goes, but I am pointing out a potential problem down the road. <laughs> and it's very realistic that Indiana would be a holdout, obviously. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. Mark Emmert in the NCAA, I, I, not just him, but like the whole board of governors signed the letter. In my opinion, in order to make me feel better, and, and that's really the only person I'm concerned about is how I feel. You have got to do better than just say, well, we don't like this, and if you pass this law, it's going to mess us up, which, mm -hmm. which is what the letter reeked of. I, I, I mean, you need to come up, in my opinion, with some sort of plan or legal strategy if you're going to fight it or some sort of plan that makes it fair, and that might even mean giving everybody to a degree across the board their name, image, and likeness. Well, well, well he did say in there – that he thought that that well, the board of governors thought that the California law was unconstitutional. Yes, it's that's unconstitutional <laughs> to for people to make money based on their talents. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, he I didn't explain country. how it was unconstitutional. <laughs> I think and when they say country. things like that, it's just like, yeah, we can win this fight, but like, uh, this fight can be won, but only by people that know how to fight. Do you know how to fight when you're making a comment like that? <laughs> Yeah, the the only the only even semblance it's it's a ridiculous <laughs> comment is if some way through the federal higher education laws they can squeeze themselves in and say well California is interfering and differentiating itself on commerce which is the which is uh, the uh, dominion of uh, the national government not not the uh, not the state government, but if the national government's silent on something, marijuana, once again, on the actual legalization at the end of the day, uh, then, sorry, you can do it within your own state boundaries. Well, 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 well Joby, are you then saying that, like, if, if I'm just a regular old poli-sci major who suddenly somebody wants to give me 20 bucks to put my face on a billboard, I can't do it, I'll get thrown out of school? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're hitting on the ridiculousness of it. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, I, I have a cool blog that a lot of people like, Yeah, you know, and some guy wants to advertise on it. If you're a poli-sci major, you can do it. And you're just, you're really personable, et cetera. And you like to come on Hoops HD and, you know, someone wants to give us money and yeah. Uh, anyone that wants to give us money, we do accept. Yeah, yeah we, we <laughs> accept money. <laughs> We're not in school, unfortunately. Uh, I guess that a little, little more for each of you here. I, I think we've covered a lot of ground, a lot of good conversation. But any, any other thoughts on this entire topic here? Uh, yeah, one right, of the David, things. Yeah, Chad, you and I, and, and oftentimes uh, Stalika and even Rocco, uh, we have our under the radar show that we do every week throughout the season. And while they're sort of running up a much steeper hill as it is. Uh, but there's been some breakthroughs. We saw multiple teams get not just inside the bubble this year, but up into the top half of the bracket, mm -hmm. namely Wofford and Buffalo. And it's not that unusual to see under the radar teams in the rankings in the top half of the bracket and inside the bubble. But if you go back and look at the 2001, 2002, 2000 NCAA brackets, there may have been one. I think one. I think in two of those three years, there were zero if name, image, and likeness comes through, do we sort of go back to that simply because those schools, unless you watch under the radar, aren't as visible. So their likeness and names aren't going to be worth as much as even, say, a mid-level or poor power conference team. I, I, I don't think so, David, just because John Morant is still at Murray State. You know, until the transfer rules, that's where that might have a different yeah. issue altogether. You're still but, going to have people who are – under the radar recruits who turn out to be outstanding making some of these and you have like at Wofford it was a system as much as it's some very good players but also right. a system that created it I think yeah. you'll still see that 
Uh, right. Uh, let me say this, Joe. Like one of the selling points or attempted selling points, if you've been around the Ohio Valley or the Horizon League, not those specifically, but leagues like that, is that you can sell your program as as opposed to being in a mid-level or low-level Power 5 conference and possibly not playing or contributing, you can come here, you can play a lot, and you can be on a team that, that competes at the top of a, of a worse league, but like at the top of the league. And a lot of kids, I think, do make that choice. It's like, well, I'd rather win at a mid-level under-the-radar conference than lose at a power conference. But that – I think that it might make it harder to get players. I could foresee that being a possibility, but I, I'm not psychic. I mean, we'll, we'll see how it how, plays. How out. many players I'll, I'll pick on Chad here. And I'm dead serious. How many players choose though, the Wofford types, the Buffalo types over a Rutgers, you, you know, I mean, I don't think that still happens a ton. Uh, it, but yeah. you just Those mentioned, teams are you mentioned job, job more rent. I don't know. There's some guy that played that played at a Davidson school that was nothing that that got a little bit that had a pretty good NBA career, I think. Yeah, yeah. Curry yeah, something yeah, or other. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and but he <laughs> he was despite having a dad who played in the NBA, he wasn't and whose dad and his dad's alma mater being at the time crappy of Virginia Tech they still didn't offer what is now one of the greatest shooters in the history of the game. It's crazy that they didn't, but they didn't. You're still going to have the Curries of the world, the John Morants, et cetera, I think will find their way there because they are simply overlooked. But that is obviously you can count on one hand, those sort of, you know, NBA lottery picks that come from there uh, that aren't, overseas weirdness yeah, yeah you know you know sort of thing happen but i also look at a place like the patriot league for example where you had a donald foil in the 90s yeah. you had cj mccollum at the beginning of this decade i mean mm -hmm. those players are once in a generation but by the same token how many guys from the patriot league are going to be looking at other places Right. And, and, and yeah, it's, I think it's always going to happen. Go ahead, Rocco. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think programs like that, I think, well, maybe not the Patriot League examples, but some of the ones you guys mentioned. Plus, you know, I'm down the road from St. Mary's. They get, if you have a, top, a good prospect coming out of Australia, good luck beating St. Mary's for that guy. Um, I mean, they've, I mean, most of the uh, Australian national team this year was, I think, four St. Mary's players. Randy Bennett's got a pipeline. If you look at Buffalo, Buffalo had a great recruiting class coming in this year until. Nate Oates took the Alabama job. There's a kid out of Seattle that had six Pac-12 offers and chose Buffalo. Had no, no ties to New York. Um, so some guys are just recruiting at a different level. There's all different reasons what, how and why that happens. But they, the top mid-major programs are creating niches for themselves. New Mexico State's an example where they're, they're waiting on uh, kids to fall out of a big program, and they're taking pretty much anybody and everybody in and, and bringing them to a place like Las Cruces where they're – away from distractions and they, they have a great team every year. So, I mean, I think there's just, um, you know, a lot of variable variables and it's a little bit loaded for some of those programs, but I think in general, uh, that larger bubble discussion that I was kind of introducing earlier um, where, is where we might see some bigger change and it's already beginning. So like this year, Kansas and Oregon were two programs that missed out on their big targets recruiting wise, and they're still coming into this year as potentially top 10 teams. Because then they were able to go ahead and get guys from the, the class. class. Yeah, re, the reclassification things becoming a huge trend. And then also um, guys that are eligible to grad transfer, they're basically getting re-recruited. And they almost have to tell their current head coach, hey, I don't want any more phone calls. Uh, there's a few articles about that going around. But, th that, I mean, more kids are leaving for the bigger program than staying with the, uh, like the Anthony Lamb, who actually did stay with Vermont. You know he got – a million phone calls this summer to play for a power five. So um, it's, it's really interesting, but the more, the more that top talent that either skips college basketball altogether, um, the more that there's a, there's a funnel happening and the mid majors and the low majors just become a minor league system. And that's what's happened to like the NEC where they lost almost every NEC program. I think two summers ago lost uh, at least a starter or two to, to, to transfer. But I like the to I like the yeah. Anthony Lamb comparison because that's pretty similar to Mike Dom at South Dakota State last year, who was also right. a game changer. But then Moody Absolutely. starts in the national title game. 
Yeah, know. exactly. You know. Mm-hmm. I guess then let, let, let me run through each of you here for any other final thoughts. We're just about out of time here, at, but on this entire topic or anything else that's going on in the college sports world. And Joby, let me start with you. Well, you know, speaking of, you know, incentives to go to school, uh, one topic which I'm sure is hot for a lot of people is what's happening at the University of Kansas. Uh, that we What's should are they, are they playing Mizzou? Mizzou's back on the schedule. <laughs> Is that what you're about to say? Where's the buzzer? David won. <laughs> <laughs> they play Mizzou. Uh, but yeah, this is the the issues, and we're waiting on other allegations. NC State's received theirs. Kansas has received theirs. Let's not kid ourselves. LSU and Arizona are imminent. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, let's not let's not be uh, be silly and think that they aren't. Um, it will be very interesting how that plays in, you know, how that uh, uh, relates to the discussion in California, how the two, because at the end of the day, Kansas, uh, it's, you know, it's about paying someone under the table. And I think even if you go even to the extreme where you have image and likeness, uh, you have uh, you have a, uh, even a pay a scale, et cetera. The fact of the matter is you will still have – there is no end to it. You will – you know, oh, kids can get – you know, the top prospects can get 50000 or 100000 for their image and likeness. There will still be people coming out of the woodwork to offer more because exactly. they want to win. The, there is no end stop to this. That's why, to harken back to what I mentioned earlier, there has to be some rules in place and some ability that if people cross the line on those rules, you still have the ability to punish them, prevent them from postseason, uh, from uh, a, a postseason experience. Uh, Rocco, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Joby was on the same line as what I was thinking for final thought. I, I just wanted to come back to David's question, you know, what happens to Louisville and Kansas and NC State and the others once a couple of years goes by. And, you know, even even with what we know now, at least according to the FBI findings and all that, you know, there was 30 to 50 schools involved, some of them much heavier, heavier involved or, or caught than others. But I think what we see here is an entire system, grassroots system that, you know, facilitates basically all the programs that uh, have any kind of, not, not all the programs, but the majority of programs that are uh, experiencing um, different levels of success, especially in recruiting. And so um, I, th- I think there's a, there's an issue uh, across the board. You can't penalize all, you know, 40 out of the top 75 teams and tell them they're all not going to the tournament one year. So, you know, they've got to, they got to come up with different ways to address it. I think they're, I, again, the punishments lately that have come out in the last two to three investigations, uh, whether it be football or basketball, besides Missouri, um, which the football team is not allowed to go to postseason, um, have really just been about going backwards and having banners taken down and different types of fines, maybe a scholarship or two. Um, so, you know, I, I'm really curious to see what they do about it because I don't think just taking postseason away from 40 of the top 75 is going to be a viable solution. It's going to it's going to kill their, you know, ratings come tournament time, that kind of thing. So um, just kept my, I guess my final thought is I'm curious to see how they, they really do deal with that. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be interesting. Uh, Sleeka, let me throw it over to you. We talk about recruiting violations as it relates to Kansas, but I'm going to one-up you and go in a slightly different direction. There is one coach that's a, that has gone on for, what, four years now, has – one postseason appearance in the CIT is going to begin the season with a, a three-game suspension because oh. of recruiting violations. But Poor somehow, thing. because this is bizarro world and it's DePaul, he's in the process of getting a contract extension. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing what a potential positive recruiting can do? But by the same token, historically, if you're going to beat DePaul and having wins vacated, Shouldn't you at least be getting to the NCAA tournament first? Shouldn't you at least have wins to get wins vacated? But, uh, David, uh, uh, let, let me throw it over to you. Um, 
what, what's the best way to encapsulate this? I, I go, I, I have more questions than I do answers. Uh, would this, I mean, you hear all this language, this is going to radically change the game. And I understand why people think that uh, if players get paid, it wouldn't be the same. If we give them name, image, and likeness, we have to regulate it. But I, I think that there's another reality that, that not many people are tuned into. And that's sort of like the under the table, sort of, you know, the, what goes on in the dark and behind the scenes. Um, I, I would like, I, I, there's over 50%, not much more, but a little more than half of all D1 players ultimately end up playing pro basketball and making about 60 or in making more than $60,000. So a lot, it's not just the top NBA prospects that are targeted and funneled money to, and that have, that have the attention of agents, agents that represent players that play overseas want access to, to players as well. And I, I, I don't want to, you know, when half of them are, are, basically potential targets for agents or shoe companies or apparel companies or foreign teams. How many of that, of them do you think are getting something that's that they're not supposed to be getting, or that's against the rule that's going on behind the scenes? I'm not saying it's everybody, but I'm saying that it's way, way, way more than what most people would probably guess. I saw someone say that it was less than 1% of all college players that are probably getting paid. I think it's more like 15 or 20%. So there's another part of me that says if these new rules went into place and players were allowed their name, image, and likeness and, and access to agents, it may not be any different at all. It may not look any different. Yeah. I don't uh, know. Interesting. That, thought. That, that, that is, that is interesting. I, I, I got to tell you that, that personally, uh, you know, if you'd asked me the same, if we had the same conversation five, six years ago with me, I would have said, no, we got to preserve the amateurism model. We got to preserve the NCAA uh, because, you know, I've always been a throwback type of person to that. But uh, I, I'm convinced now as well, we've got we've to gotta allow these kids to find a way to get money here. Because just as David just said, it's going to happen anyhow. So why not regulate it? Uh, just like marijuana, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, I guess on that note, I do want to thank everybody for joining us. I think we've had a great conversation here tonight. Uh, we'll get this posted on the website. Obviously, we've got a lot of content it's already posted to the website oh, if people true. are watching uh, it yeah, true. it's but, already uh, there uh we are going to have a lot of content coming up during the month of october season previews uh we may have a special podcast uh with a special guest coming up soon as well david and i are working on that but uh again once again thanks for everybody for joining us and we will talk to you again real soon